Hello there everybody and welcome back to the Talking City podcast brought to you by the Manchester Evening News. Joining me today to blissfully talk about City again after an absolute slog of an international break is of course Mr Joe Bray. Joe, how's it going? Well yeah, as you say, now we are back to proper football. I'm good. Mm-hmm. The last couple of weeks with without any proper football to talk about have been a bit of a drag but now we, we, we can mm-hmm. get straight back into it now can't we? Well, you say that, we actually are going to start off this podcast, this return of, you know, <laughs> slagging off the international break as we've done straight from the opener. You know, me and you aren't the smartest Sai, who's got this whole week off and I'm imagining he's enjoying Four, himself somewhere fine, sunny. Yeah, very, very smart man. But before we kind of jump straight into club football, why don't we have a little a little discussion about the internationals? Because, yeah, you know, we slag it off, but the games themselves tend to be all right. It's just, I feel like the gaps in between when it's just so dead. But thankfully... The matches, or at least England's first game, was a pretty good watch against Italy. I know it seems like years ago now, because a whole seven days. But it was a great game over in Naples. A 2-1 win for England. The first in Italy for like 64 years or something. Outrageous like that. So a great result. And there was a surprise name in that starting eleven of Calvin Phillips. Now, I believe it's only his third start of the season. Maybe in all competitions for club or country. Maybe his fourth. He's obviously had a... Pretty torrid time of it at City, um, yet to start in the Premier League this year. I think he's only got about half an hour of minutes in the Premier League to his name, if that. But he, he played against Italy against a tough midfield of Berea and uh, Verratti and the like, and, and he, he imposed himself pretty well and helped uh, England to a, a pretty historic victory. Yeah, I think it was quite telling as well that as soon as Southgate had his sort of, let's say, most of his squad available, he starts Phillips and he went with Phillips and Rice again in midfield to then allow Jude Bellingham to go forward. He couldn't really do that in the World Cup just because Phillips had that injury that he'd only just come back for. And yeah, like you say, we, we're negative about the international break, but only because as writers, we have nothing to write about. There is a lot of interesting talking points with these games and it is an opportunity for players like Phillips to to get minutes that he wouldn't do. Now, it feels a bit weird that Phillips gets more minutes for England or it feels like he does than than he does for City, but I think it could be quite a useful performance that from from Phillips, and it's a, it's a reminder that he is a good player. We've only seen him in flashes, and 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 not really sort of. He, he comes off the bench for City, doesn't he? When it when they're winning, and he he can't really do anything. And when he has played, it's been like against Southampton, for example, where everyone was rubbish and he couldn't really do anything. This was a game where the whole team set up. And he's an integral part of it and he's not coming in to replace Rodri. He doesn't have a point to prove. So I, th- I think we saw the kind of Calvin Phillips that, that City wanted to to sign. And I, I did my maths. I think it might have been skewed by the fact that he didn't play um, against Ukraine. But I think in the seven games for club and country leading up to the Italy game, he played more than he has done in the whole of the, the rest of the season. And for two of those games, he was on the bench for City and didn't didn't come on. So he, he's starting, slowly but surely, he's starting to get a few more a few more minutes under his belt, a bit more responsibility, a few more games where he can come on and, and get a little bit more time to show Guardioli what, what he can do. He's not going to displace Rodri. Rodri is integral to what City do. And if City are going to win anything this season, Rodri's going to be sort of dictating that, that midfield. But if Phillips can use the rest of the season... To, to just continue growing, learning, showing what he's he's picking up in training. I think we'll, we might be able to see what we see with quite a lot of players in the, the second season. There's a bit more of, of a role for him and, you know, England are playing at the end of the season and they're, they're the internationals that last year everybody hated and England played rubbish, but they weren't expected to play well. That could be an opening for Phillips where he can say, right, I've not played that much for City, they won one, two, maybe three trophies. Now, now we can try and get a couple of minutes and, and go into the summer and then come back and do say what Jack Grealish did last year. But I, I, I looked at that Italy game and I thought that's that's the Calvin Phillips that City signed and we've not seen that yet this season. So it can only be a positive that he's got that ninety minutes under his belt. Absolutely, and you know it's coming as we'll touch on um, later on in the podcast. It's coming up to a, the real business end of the season now. April itself is going to be an absolute. Um, crucial month. I think there's at least eight fixtures, as we touched on in the last episode, potentially nine, depending on where that Brighton game gets slotted in. In all likelihood, Phillips is going to have to play at some point, and are you right? It's not going to be for Rodri, more than likely. He's 
Rodri's spot, especially now, as I say, going into these really important games where every match matters now, as we'll as you know, as we'll touch on, knockout football and basically knockout in the league. If that if City drop any more points, they could probably say goodbye to the title um with the way Arsenal are going. Every game is so important. So you're probably not going to lose Rodri. But what I saw um in that England match that he wasn't playing the Rodri role. He Declan Rice was the one in the middle and you know Declan Rice was brilliant. He scored. He wasn't exactly sitting himself, but he was the one theoretically in the sitting role and in the middle whereas Phillips was to the right and had a bit more um freedom to get on the ball going forward and I I think I said when it, it was actually signed in the summer rather than being a Fernandinho replacement and a Rodri backup he could equally be the Gundogan backup slash replacement because he's really good on the ball I think we've seen well, he surprised everybody uh in the Euros it would have been wouldn't it when he got that assist for Sterling in the uh mm-hmm. first game against Croatia I thought it was great, great <laughs> memory. See, so he's got that pass in him, that slide rule pass, that good eye for for an assist. He has got the qualities to play in the team of City's caliber. You know, Guardiola probably wouldn't have signed him and put him straight into the team in the squad if he wasn't capable of doing it. He's been hamstrung by the shoulder problem. He's missed a lot of the season. He, you know, as you say, correctly say there, it takes a lot of forwards and midfield sort of players at least a year to get started um to get used to Guardiola's kind of really difficult and diff- different and unique methods and he's already 6 months behind really because he's he's not played that much and he's you know it's not I don't think he's not played as much as we expected just because he's not good enough I think it's because his fitness has clearly had issues there and when Rodri, Bernardo, Gundogan and De Bruyne are all fit and not dropping out and playing really well mostly it's hard for him to get in, but I did see in that England match, sorry, in the Italy match, I should say, he had that kind of edge, that combative, combativeness that City can sometimes lack. You know, it was a cauldron at Naples, um, a really hostile game, and he, he stepped up and he showed a, a lot of character and, you know, sometimes that's what City have lacked, um, that bit of bite, that bit of edge when, when games really kind of get tasty and, you know, when... We get to these Champions League knockouts, the you know FA Cup finals, semi-finals, these you know massive games coming up with Liverpool, Chelsea, Arsenal. That bit of fight, that bit of edge, could be what City need and what they've been missing in those sort of games in years gone by. Yeah, I think his role to to the end of the season will be replacing Rodri with half an hour to go, twenty minutes to go, just to ease ease the sort of minutes on Rodri. So say you've got, I'm, I'm looking at the fixtures now. Say they're beating Leicester later in the month and they know they've got to go to Bayern Munich for the second leg they can take Rodri off bring Phillips on knowing that he's getting better and he's slowly but surely learning the ropes and he can do that and not be not really make any mistakes I'll I'll touch wood when I say that because he has made mistakes so far this season but they they seem to be dropping a little bit and he's you just watch him when he comes on. He's just thinking a bit more about his position and where he should be and who he's passing to. And he's thinking a pass or two ahead. I'm not saying he didn't do that before, but he he just fe- he just looks a little bit more like a city player, um, which we haven't seen so far. But I mean, from the start of his from his city career, he was hamstrung a little bit that on the preseason tour they didn't have any central defenders. So his first two appearances were as a centre back, which wasn't his position. Then. He wasn't playing at the start of the season because Rodri was there and the first time he did get a, a start, which was the friendly at Barcelona, he messed up his shoulder and, and we didn't see him again until really the World Cup. He did play once or twice, but it was still bothering him, wasn't it? So like like you say, that his first six months of his career have basically just been written off. But no, I think he's uh, hopefully showing signs that he's uh, he's coming back and, and he's fit now and he can he can play a role towards the end of the season. Exactly, and you only need to look at Nathan Ake for a player who didn't set the world alight when he first arrived at City and give it a year or two and all of a sudden he's he's the best thing going. I mean, has a player's stock risen as much this season than Nathan Ake? I mean, he's been brilliant for City, but then he goes away with the Netherlands and yes, it was only against Gibraltar, but he scored twice in that game and I believe he was involved with 16 chances, the most of any Dutch player in a match ever, I believe the stat was, or something along those lines, wow. with, na- I think it was, I think he had nine efforts, or, and then whatever that is, take 16, 
seven, eight. I can't do maths. That's why I'm a writer. The other of those in <laughs> creating chances, or it was the other way around. He was involved with like 16 chances, scored twice. I think. I mean, I think uh, the Dutch had about 30 odd shots and only. I might even be 50 and only scored three goals against Gibraltar. So probably not actually that good a result, but certainly a good night for Ake. And you know, he's just continuing to be so important uh, for City. You know, we'll talk about. Uh, the weekend's game coming up, but he's probably one of the first names on the team sheet for that, whether it be at centre-back, the left of a back three, or at left-back, whatever Guardiola goes with. Wherever he's been asked to play, even an occasion, very occasionally, kind of filling in that holding midfield role for a couple of minutes, anywhere he's playing, he's just excelling at the moment. And, you know, He's actually older than I thought he was. He is 28 now, mm-hmm. but he's, you know, it just seems like he's learned so much under Guardiola, come such a long way. And to, you know, to be playing so well that Jao Cancelo goes to buy Munich on loan and to hold down that left-back spot. It's, it's got to the point where I can see City not buying a left-back again in the summer because Ake is doing so well. That would be typical, wouldn't it? And then he'll get injured oh, I can the first see week of the season yep. uh, just after the uh, the window closes. But no, he, Just he, after he, Cancelo's he's, been sold. <laughs> ab- absolutely. He, he's been brilliant though, hasn't he? And the, as you say, the, the fact that they felt able to get rid of Cancelo because they had someone like Nathan Ake and you know Pep Guardiola's calling calling Ronald Koeman in in the international break saying happy birthday but also look after Nathan for us because he's so important and uh, I think Koeman interrupted a press conference he did a press conference with Ake and Ake answered something and, and Koeman then said by the way this guy is the model of model professionals because he's he just worked so hard and I, th- I think he, he echoed basically everything that Guardiola said in in that when he's not playing, he's still got the perfect attitude and he's still working hard and doing everything right in training and, and just waiting for his chance. And I, I don't think there's any player that you can sort of be less happy for, if you like. You, you can't not smile at Nathan Ake doing well because he seems just like a lovely guy. He's worked hard. He's a very good player. Um, I'm, I'm amazed how I always think a winger has got around him and then he'll just pull out a sliding tackle and, and he, he stopped them and, and the Etihad sort of rises to its feet and, and applauds him and, and yeah he's he's taken his form from, from City into the Netherlands okay they got demolished by France and, and he started there but that sounds like it was a, a case of France being good and the whole Netherlands squad not being on it so can't, I'm not sure you can place too much blame at, at Ake's feet and then to, to bounce back with a couple of goals, he'll he'll come back to City with a, a lot of confidence. And I mean, ha, we, we, we're going to talk about the Liverpool game, aren't we? A year ago, if you told us that City would be playing Liverpool at the start of April in a game that they need to win to keep up the title challenge and they'll be starting Nathan Ake at left back and everyone will be delighted with it. You'd, you'd have laughed at you, wouldn't you? So no, I think, I think he's... Uh, I wrote this, I think, one of my international break pieces is that if Erling Haaland wasn't there, surely Nathan Ake would be one of the contenders for player of the season. He's been he's been that good. Like Haaland will win all the awards, but Nathan Ake deserves a, a place in that conversation. I feel like he's like the definition of would win the players, player of the award sort of thing, like the Absolutely, unsung yeah. hero sort of player who's just always there, so reliable. And I think we noticed as well, he's like he was captain at Bournemouth for a time, so he's already got, he's got those credentials in him, but you can see, as you say, talking press conferences. He's done, he's done City ones before, before Champions League games. He's such a kind of mature presence, so um, kind of eloquent in the way he talks about the map, the game and stuff. I'm sure you know City have that kind of leadership committee, don't they, with four or five players who are the in the order of the captaincy. You know, we don't know where the likes of uh, kind of Gundogan, who is currently the captain, if he'll still be here next summer and that. Um, if there's just, you know changes in that kind of group it would not surprise me in the slightest if we hear that Ake has been promoted to the captaincy order at the um next season just and that's you know that's not even just because of how well he's improved and how important he's become on the pitch it's because you can just clearly tell he's such a good um such a good egg in the dressing room such a good character yeah I'd imagine he's he's very well respected and you have you ever heard anyone say a bad word about Nathan Ake there you are he's uh exactly yeah he, he seems like just a very nice guy, a very good footballer, and he's he's getting the rewards for a lot of hard work. And I, I saw a tweet the other day of like everyone was laughing when it City paid forty million, but now it, do, it doesn't look too bad a signing, doesn't it? Forty million for for Nathan Ake. Absolute bargain, absolute bargain. But I'll tell you, someone who has had some uh, bad words coming their way over the last few days, and that is Rodri. He's a quite the. Uh, 
quite the eventful international break. Uh, Spain defeated Norway 3-0, of course, uh, Norway without Erling Haaland, but they did have Martin Odegaard, <laughs> much to Rodri's chagrin, as he absolutely took him out at one stage in quite a robust challenge. I, I, you know, I, I'm, I'd like to think, I'm sure City fans were delighted to see that. I don't know if Rodri had the upcoming title race in mind or not, or if he was just <laughs> solely focusing on the game, but it was some challenge. And then, of course, Spain shockingly fell to a 2-0 defeat to Scotland, it was only it was a much changed Spain side from the one that beat Norway. Rodri was one of the few um, starters who survived. I think it was eight changes the new manager made, and don't ask me his name because I've absolutely never heard of him. I think he was the under twenty one <laughs> boss before he took charge. And um, I say they lost, and then afterwards Rodri got the media duties, was not particularly happy, and just said. Well played, Scotland. You, you know, well done. But that was a you play a bit rubbish, which you know, it's funny in it. It's so so bitter. <laughs> you can't. It's hard to blame anyone, but you know, just lost. Take it, take it on chin, lad. Come on. But yeah, an eventful one for Rodri. So, um, absolutely. Yeah, he was having a go, wasn't he? At how physical Scotland were and the time wasting, and I, th- I think Scotland, time wasting. The whole of From Scotland s- pointed <laughs> out that a Spain were doing that, and b. Rodri does that every single week with the team. Like, if, if you're looking for someone who's going to get in a physical battle, Rodri is right up there yeah. in your Spain and your City squad. So. But he, he said it before, I, I, I think at least once this season, he's come out and had a go at teams who mm. play very defensive and make it hard to to sort of pass the ball around and, and use those sort of dark arts, if you like. So maybe he just doesn't like that. I don't know. I can imagine he wouldn't have been best pleased at, at having be, been beaten by Scotland because... Uh, that's not a bit, not a good result at all for Spain, but uh, no, it, it did feel a bit a bit bitter, and uh, it was quite enjoyable just to see how riled up Scotland got as a, as a country, because <laughs> clearly it was just a, a player wasn't happy at a performance, and uh, he he managed to push a lot of buttons in uh, in Scotland, didn't he? But uh, he, he captained Spain there, so we're talking about captains before, and mm. uh, that sort of underlines his sort of leadership abilities. But I, I don't know, will he get the armband again after? Uh, after an interview like that, and uh, yeah, like you say, the uh, the Norway game, that tackle against Erdegaard. I mean, he won the ball, didn't he? Yes, it was physical. Yes, he went in. Yes, he got the man, but he won the ball. And Erdegaard was sort of lining up to shoot. He's not going to sort of move out the way. It was a very strong tackle, and you know you've seen him give him. But I put it this way, I'm looking see... forward to the rematch. I... Yeah, I don't, I don't see the, the sort of uproar. And I saw some Arsenal fans trying to be like, he went in on Kieran Tierney as well in the Scotland game. And, <laughs> well, yeah, he's not going to just duck out of challenges, isn't he? And I, I, I mean, it might have played a part in his, his thinking instead of just going to block the shot and try and get in, but surely not. I, I don't, I don't, I, see, I don't yeah, buy I think that we're having at all. A bit of a laugh. No, not at all. I think we're having a laugh there, even though he, he, he might be looking like a one-man Arsenal extermination squad, but... <laughs> I'm, yeah, I'm sure. I'm I mean, they don't like him anyway, do they? Because mind. of his his celebration last year at, at the Emirates, <laughs> and I don't know. He, he goes under the radar so much. Like his his brilliance is that you don't notice him, but he does mm-hmm. everything right. And then suddenly yeah. he's 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 sort of riling one side of North London and the whole of Scotland, and becoming like a pantomime villain, isn't he? So I don't know if he can uh, bring City along on that ride. It might be uh, might be a bit of good fun in the last couple of months of the season. Well, it's all set up for some karmic justice against Arsenal, isn't it? Either one way or the other, um, there's going to be egg on faces somewhere, I suspect. So one one subplot to look out for there. But, you know, you mentioned him having the armband. Someone else who got the armband and will be keeping it for quite a while was Kevin De Bruyne. He is now the skipper of Belgium following Eden Hazard's retirement and uh, a good start to, to life as that. Two wins for him um, in his first captains, uh, in his first games as captaincy. And, of course, a, a win against Germany in which he scored the winning goal with a lovely little side rule finish after running onto a ball. Um, you know, we talked a lot about De Bruyne before the international break. Um, he had a bit of a dip in form. He roared back to his best just before the break and now he's he's continued that for his country and that certainly bodes well for City. I think he got two assists in that game as well. So he got two assists and a goal in a, in a 3-2 win and I know Germany were making a lot of changes and um, like, for example, Gundogan wasn't even in the squad A for rotation and B because he's is uh, his wife's just given birth to a baby boy but um, I mean it's yeah De Bruyne has done very, very well there and I think he said when he was given the armband that he's got no plans of stopping and he wants to play at the highest level and his ambition is always at the top and we we saw in the last two games against Leipzig and, and Burnley that De Bruyne's looking a little bit back to his his best after Guardiola's called him out and said he needs to go back to basics 
if if you look at his his record then in in four games since he's got I don't know how many assists and goals but he's it'll be more than a goal or assist a game because he's playing very well and he's just I mean we said it before if De Bruyne's back to basics is running the show on in Champions League games and international level against Germany then City are, City are going to benefit from that when he comes back and maybe maybe Guardiola's just pushed the right buttons there and and riled him up enough to to uh, to prompt a bit of a, a reaction and no he's he's doing it well and if he's a player that needs the armband for his country to to continue performing and that confidence boost and maybe even a little bit of an ego boost or great City will uh, City will take that all day long and uh, you imagine he will he will come back and be well up for a, a very very important couple of months at City. Absolutely, and just a kind of roundup of the rest. You know, Grealish, Stones, and Walker were all in action for England as well. Grealish missed an absolute sitter against oh. Italy, which was such a shame because I thought he was playing so well in that match. And yeah, that miss it was like, oh come on, Jackie boy, You've got to be sticking those away. Um, there was a goal and an assist for Riyad Mahrez playing for Algeria. Um, uh, illness ruled Edison out. Hopefully, I presume he's back and hopefully he's back in training for the weekend. That's good to know. Um, City certainly need him, and then. Finally, I mean, amazing scenes over in Argentina. Julian Alvarez got to, you know, take part in the party of the century as Argentina returned to uh, El Monumental for, to celebrate with the World Cup trophy. Two wins. I mean, Messi doing outrageous stuff, <laughs> an amazing free kick um, uh, at the death to win um, that in in that match, and then he scored a hat trick in the next game to take his career international tally to 100 goals. You know, hopefully Alvarez two won't go over from that because like some part we've seen the pictures of <laughs> every Argentina player dressed to the nines <laughs> and Messi just in his Argentina track here, not giving yeah. uh, two hoots whatsoever. Absolutely legendary tackle. Um, yeah, you know, great to see Alvarez having fun. Hopefully he's back because he, as we'll touch on momentarily, could well be uh, relied upon on Sunday. Well, I think Argentina started the same side who started the World Cup final in that sort of homecoming. And yeah, those scenes were incredible just before the game. But then they took him off at half time and he didn't play the next game. So he only played 45 minutes. And normally you'd say City would maybe want him to play a bit more, but they might be a little bit glad given Erling Haaland's injury that uh, Alvarez seems well rested. Yeah, we've seen the videos of uh, him pulling the shapes on the dance floor. So uh, he seems like he's had a, a good little break over there in, in Argentina. and. Well deserved, obviously, because of the the, the World Cup. But uh, no, Alvarez will be uh, very much needed at City going uh, going forward, especially in the next couple of weeks. You would uh, expect, and yeah, elsewhere in the break, most most players did well. I don't think anyone did too badly, apart from injuries. Really, I think Edison was a bit unlucky in the way that Allison wasn't in the squad, and he basically had a chance to to Cursed. make that number one shirt his own, and then he fell ill with like a stomach bug and. I think he was on the bench for their their one game, but he he didn't come off, and yeah, that that's just unlucky. And it probably sums up his international career, doesn't it? In 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 mm-hmm. one international break where he, he gets the chance, finally gets the chance, and then he he, he can't play for something out of his control. But um, I think it's also good to see Riyad Mahrez, who again will probably be needed for City in the next couple of weeks, getting a, a 90th minute goal and then a an assist for the only the only goal in a game and. Uh, Algeria are now qualified for African Cup of Nations, so City will obviously deal with that. I imagine it's ne- next year. It's not. It's normally in January, isn't it? So uh, mm. I don't. I don't know when it is, but uh, yeah, City will, will, will deal with that. But Riyad Mahrez is playing well and playing well for Algeria always does well. As a result for for City going forward as well. Well, that's it. The international break is over. Mm-hmm. We will talk about it no oh, more. Goodness for that. And that. And as is part one, we'll be back in just a moment to look forward to the return of club football and, of course, Manchester City versus Liverpool. Hello there, everybody, and welcome back to the Talking City podcast. Now, Joe, there's a massive game this weekend, and I'm not talking about... The Papa John's Trophy. I am, of course, talking <laughs> about Manchester City versus Liverpool. It's a game with everything on the line for both teams. It's not quite the uh, the winner takes all blockbuster top of the table clash we, or Champions League clash for that matter. We've become used to in uh, over the last five years or so. Liverpool have 
um, kind of fallen to the wayside a little bit in a transition season, but they're still battling for top four. They need as many points as they can get. They're currently about seven points off Newcastle, or Tottenham currently in fourth, I think. Um, so they need as many wins as they get. They'll be coming here, um, no doubt, wanting to win. And City, of course, as I touched on earlier, need all the wins they could possibly get. They currently sit eight points behind Arsenal with a game in hand, but they won't want that gap to get any bigger, of course, and they want to shrink it to five ahead of Arsenal's fixture at the weekend. Yeah, I mean, I think maybe a month or two ago, maybe before Christmas, it would have been a different game, but you can see signs of, of Liverpool coming back. They, they now know that they're in a top four race and uh, I mean, they beat Man United 7-0, didn't they, in, in the game before last in the league and then they went and followed it up against Bournemouth and if that doesn't sum up the season, then I don't think anything does. So City will have to expect that the 7-0 side will, will turn up. They've uh, they've been beaten by Liverpool, obviously, already this season and that was quite a, a tight, interesting game and even when Liverpool weren't on a great run themselves, they still managed to... They always show up against City, don't they? And I mean, it was a good game in the, in the Carabao Cup. Obviously, both sides had players missing just after the World Cup but um, I mean it's one of them where you still you, you just can't you, you can't predict what's going to happen even though Liverpool are not at their best they're welcoming back some players they've uh, I think they'll have a point to prove they've they've had that Bournemouth result they've been uh, beaten in the Champions League by by Real Madrid they'll want to even if they can't win the league themselves they'll want to stop City doing it won't they and if they win and Arsenal would then go and win and, and increase the gap. We wouldn't hear the end of it, would we? And uh, I, I do think that it, it really doesn't matter where Liverpool are in the table. I think this will be one of City's toughest games of the season. Every game will be tougher than the last. Now we're getting into the last couple of months of the season, but this one is a really, really difficult one to, to sort of restart and re, rediscover that momentum that City would have had. If City played this game directly after the Burnley game and beating Leipzig, they'd have been full of confidence. Now they've had a couple of weeks off, everyone's gone away, done different things, obviously a couple of injuries have, are now going to play the part. It's got a bit of a different dynamic, but um, on the other hand of that, if you can't get yourself up for City versus Liverpool, then you're probably not in the uh, in the right team, are you? Absolutely. I mean, as you say, it's really finely poised. They've you know, Liverpool, as we've said, been so up and down this season, more down than up. But against City, they do tend to raise the game. As you say, they dealt City their first defeat of the season, which kind of sent City on a bit of a spiral for a few weeks, mm -hmm. where, well, a few months even, where they couldn't really get back to their best either. And, you know, we, if we count the Community Shield, Liverpool also won that, when it looked like Liverpool would mm -hmm. go and storm the title again, how, how things changed. And, of course... After the last international break, the first game back was City versus Liverpool in the Carabao Cup, as you mentioned. That was an entertaining tie, a 3-2 win for City. So both teams have had joys against one another already this year. But of course, the difference between that match and this one is that Phil Ford and Erling Haaland were involved. And neither, you'd expect, will be this time. Phil Foden is definitely out, we know that. He's had his appendix removed and it's likely at least another week or two of recovery from that surgery. And Haaland's looking increasingly doubtful as well. He pretty much missed, well, he did miss the entire international break and went to see City Specialist Doctors in Barcelona with this groin issue Then spent a few days in Marbella uh, recuperating. But we've not seen him in training yet with his teammates. It's, that he's been doing some light work but if he is fit he's definitely not going to be 100 percent i don't know if you're worth risk it's definitely not worth risking him no matter how important the game is but you know the form he's in you know what was it eight goals in the two games his last <laughs> two games it's obviously a massive loss as is Foden because he would just find his first best form as well two two big big losses for city and and Foden always plays well against liverpool mm. and always tends to have the beating of if whoever is at right back, so that that will be a big loss. But I mean, you, you would expect Grealish to continue his place. He's played every big game in the last two or three months, bar the FA Cup. He started and and done very well. And the obvious replacement is Riyad Mahrez, who's not done anything wrong to find himself out of the team. But other players have been better, so he's playing well. He's got a couple of goals, a, a goal and assist on international break. You you would say that that will be the wing pairing and, and that will be how they replace Foden. That's not too much of a loss. It's not as much of a loss as it could have been. But obviously Haaland is is the one. He, he scored against Liverpool in the, in the Carabao Cup. We, we've talked to death about his miss in the, in the Community Shield, but he would definitely want to 
to to add to it. And I mean, if he doesn't play, he, he loses one potential record of, of scoring against every team that he's faced in the Premier League. That this would be the the first one that he would he would not score against or not have the chance to to score against again. Um, so that that'll be maybe a little one, but I, th- I think he can still. There's still a record of that Mo Salah had of scoring against the most amount of opposition teams in a season, which he can still get. So a little bit of consolation and he'll probably still get every golden boot record going as well. But no, Haaland, Haaland is, is is the big one. And given that he doesn't seem to have trained on Wednesday and Thursday, even if he suddenly trained on Friday, they're playing Liverpool on Saturday lunchtime. That's not much of a turnaround. And you need Haaland for the running. You need him for Bayern Munich. You need him for, for the Arsenal game later in the month. If you've got to accept that he doesn't play against Liverpool, City have the players like Julian Alvarez who can come in and do well and has done well in previous games. I, d- I don't think you do risk him. And, you know, it, we'll hear from Guardiola later today. We're, we're recording now on Friday morning and he will give his press conference where he will almost certainly say we're training late today and I don't know and keep his cards close to his chest. I also think that City may potentially be keeping him out of the sight of cameras and training. Why would they tell Liverpool that he's mm. he is back in training? I don't think he is there, but we can't rule out that he has been training on his own or joining the, the, the squad later. It, it's no advantage to City to, to tell Liverpool before the game about Haaland's fitness. Um, so if, if Guardiola did come out and say that he's you know he's going to be out for six weeks or even a, a week or two, I, I just don't think he'll, he'll, he'll do that. I, th- I think they'll use the situation to their advantage. Um, but he, if Haaland doesn't play, it's a massive, massive blow for City, isn't it? Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And I mean, you talked about his record then against scoring against everyone he's faced. Pop quiz question. Who is mm-hmm. the only team Sergio Aguero didn't score against in the Premier League during his time at City? Oh, I wouldn't even know where to start. I can only think about teams that he has scored against. Pretty obvious clue it being me asking the question. Oh, in that case, is it Bolton Wonders? It is. Ding, ding, ding. <laughs> and he also got sent off against us for spitting um, for Atletico oh. Madrid. Back in the day, little, little history there. Bolton don't win much, but they beat Sergio Aguero, that's for sure. <laughs> we'll lift that trophy along with the Papa John's on the weekend, absolutely. But... Julian Alvarez, of course, is likely the man to come in, and it's it's going to be his biggest challenge yet for City. I, I kind of, I, you know, when we're scraping the barrel for ideas on international break, I, I kind of looked into the games he started because, as we've discussed, he tends to start with Haaland, and it's actually not the case. He started fifteen games, and nine of them have been on his own, but they tend to be the matches against lesser opposition in cups. I think it's only they've only started. He's only started his own twice in the league. Which was against Fulham and Leicester. One of the, I think it was when Haaland had an injury and he was on the bench and then he missed the full Leicester game. I think it was. He missed the full Leicester game and then came off the bench against. That's Fulham. right. So they're the only two league games Alvarez has started on his own. Um, in the cup competitions, he started on his own against Chelsea. Um, so they're the biggest teams he's played against. I think he did that twice in the FA Cup and Carabao Cup. But apart from that, his other starts have come. Um, or starts on his own, I should say, have come against uh, Southampton, Bristol, etc. and so on. But the, the thing playing in Alvarez's favour is that when he does start, um, he tends to score nine of his 12 goals for City have come when, when he started. So it's going to be interesting how, how he deals with it. Playing up front on his own is such a big game. He tends to, as I say, he tends to score when he starts, but will that be offset by the fact he's not playing with his usual strike partner and doing a role he's only tended to do in less pressure games. Yeah, it is interesting because like you say, the, those cup games, yes, he's started twice against Chelsea, but those Chelsea teams were when they were struggling quite a lot and you know the away end was singing for Graham Potter's head and they were just a shambles at the back. And if he hadn't scored there, you'd have been he'd have been really disappointed. And yeah, the other games, he, he does have to score and he does have to, to turn up and, and do it, but this I think will be the most difficult game, and I think the one that you can you can judge him off the most when you're thinking what what will he be like against Liverpool, assuming that he does he does play, is the Leicester game away, and Leicester were very very defensive, and it was a very low block, and City just didn't find him really. Now there wasn't much space to do that, and they won the game through a absolutely fantastic Kevin De Bruyne free kick. So I, th- I think 
if you judge him off that, because that's the only game that he's played, knowing that Haaland isn't there, and it's probably their most high-profile one where ha Haaland hasn't been on the bench or hasn't been available, I think that would be maybe a, a little bit of a worry, but also Liverpool aren't going to play like Leicester did. Leicester's game plan there was defend until 60, 70 minutes and then try and have a go. And City countered that quite well. And Alves was sacrificed a little bit to do that and just had to do the running with, with no reward. Against Liverpool, Liverpool are going to attack. Their, their forward players are going to want to get forward and that will therefore open space for the... Uh, you know, up the other end of the pitch. So, yeah, I, th I think he'll get a bit more joy than he did in those games. You look at those Chelsea games, he, he played against Sevilla and, and teams like that in, in the Champions League in, in similar circumstances and scored there as well. You, you would have to back him to do well. I mean, he, he started the World Cup final as a lone striker and he didn't score, but he did very well and he, he, he will do all of the running. If we if we if we've spoken so much about Haaland and and not getting involved in the build up and not doing this that and the other, even though he's scoring however many goals, Alvarez does all of the the off the ball stuff that I think people want to see from Haaland, just because they're completely different players. So yeah, Virgil Van Dijk and whoever plays next to him, Joel Matip or, or or whoever it is, they will maybe be a little bit relieved that Haaland doesn't look to be playing, but they're not going to have an easy day facing Julian Alvarez. That's for sure. Will it change City's approach at all? Because Haaland is the goal-getter, of course. I'd love to know what percentage of City's goals he's actually scored this season. It must be quite high, mm -hmm. I'd imagine. Um, at least over 50%, at the very least. Alvarez, they're not going to... You know, We've talked so much about them having to find Haaland and get him on the ball, give him service, etc. and so on. They're not going to have to do that quite as much with Alvarez. He's, he's got you know, 12 goals in a debut Premier League season, by no means a bad return at all. But he's not the clinical, absolutely ruthless goal scorer. So is it going to be a bit of a, maybe a bit of a return to the way City played last year, where they're not going to play everything through Alvarez and not expecting him to just convert every chance that comes his way. But a bit more, you know, they'll be relying on Mares, especially who's got a keen eye for goal, and Grealish and De Bruyne are likely to get in amongst the goals as well. You know, not just fudding everything through Haaland, try and spread the chances throughout the team a bit more. Yeah, maybe it'll be a bit more like the, the false nine teams that, that we were used to last season. But whenever Guardiola plays Alvarez, he says we need him because he gets in the box and he adds another body in the box. So... There will be someone on the end of those those chances and it will most probably be be Alvarez. We can be fairly confident that Grealish and Mahrez will start on the wings. The only other option really is is Bernardo, but I, I think he would play in, in midfield maybe. I, I, that, I think midfield is, is the only position where I'm not sure who's going to play. Is it going to be Bernardo or, or Gundogan? There the are arguments for, for both, aren't there? But I, I, I would expect that City are going to try and control the game and, and then use maybe the vision of De Bruyne or, or Mares or Grealish or someone like that to, to try and find Alvarez. But if if Alvarez is doing all the running, then there is going to be space for De Bruyne and, and those wingers, like we say. It it will be interesting, it will be different, but I I think City have have done done this before this season and I think they've only lost once and that was the Southampton game where everybody played badly. It wasn't just Alvarez. They, they've got a good record when Haaland doesn't play. So I think they can be fairly confident that even if they don't win, it w the the plan will still work and they will still be able to create chances. Yeah, no, fortunately for City, they're not the only ones going into the game quite depleted. Liverpool have quite a few injuries to deal with themselves. Now, you did say there were some players returning earlier, so um, if my information is incorrect off the mm -hmm. latest injury list, please do correct me. But according to the injury list I've seen, um, they were going to be without Nunes, or the released doubts, Nunes, Diaz, Thiago, uh, Joe Gomez... I can't say Basajek's name. I know he's out for the season, that young midfielder. And Simikas. There you go. I knew I could rely on you. Um, that's <laughs> you know, six right, players. But... <laughs> it sounds better than my attempt anyway. Um, that's six players there. Four of them you know, you'd know, you expect to start and important ones. Um, that you know, Liverpool going to this game, not in the greatest of Knicks either. Well, three of them did train yesterday, I'm afraid to tell you. Nah, there um, you go. There you go. Absolutely. Nunes and Simikas were doubts after injury, after international duty and they both trained so you would expect that they're both available Diaz has been out Diaz has been out for about 6 months and is back in training for sort of the first time this week with with Liverpool so he, he won't start you don't think but maybe he'll be available off the bench um 
yeah, they, they, they have their problems. And uh, they, I think Thiago of that list is the, the biggest miss for them because he's the one who, especially in the... Did he play in the in the away fixture at Anfield? Whenever he does play, he, he sort of dictates that midfield, doesn't he? And he's such a classy player. Obviously, Pep Guardiola knows him well. I think that will be a, a, a bigger miss than, than anyone else. Yeah, I mean, Nunes is getting better and better. But I think City saw him when he was when he did what he can do when he's at his best in, in the community shield where he came off and, and sort of just ran through the City defence and, and scored a goal and, and looked very, very dangerous. So they won't take anyone lightly. And I mean, Cody Gakpo hasn't had the greatest start, has he? But he's still a very good player. And C- City don't need reminding how good Liverpool are. Even Liverpool sort of second string are quality players. Mm-hmm. That Bajatic is, as we've been saying, is sort of similar similar to Rico Lewis in that he's come from nowhere and he's just slotted in perfectly and, and done really well and seems to be a, an option going forward. So they've got options all over the pitch and, and coming in reserve. And it's, it's, I mean, was it, was it the home game where I think James Milner started again and everyone was saying, oh, brilliant, Phil Foden's got mm. the beat him, beating of him. And mm. Milner actually had a very good game. Brilliant, and, yeah, he was, eh? And, and, and stopped slightly doing it play when... as well. It's slightly he'll exactly play midfield so. with the injuries they've got. So it, it just depends dis- on the day, doesn't it? Exactly, exactly. How, well, how do you see it kind of shaking out? The you know, what is your prediction? I think it's quite hard to call, especially coming in, you know, on, on into the international break. I think I'll go with a tight City win, but I, I really don't know. Just because City off tend to have the better of Liverpool at, at the Etihad, but only mm-hmm. just. And I think City are just about on better form, but without Haaland, you're not sort of guaranteed those sort of goals out of nowhere. I'll say 1-0 or 2-1, but I'd, mm-hmm. if Liverpool were to sneak something, I wouldn't be surprised. I'll I'll, I'll say I don't think it'll be a 7-0 either way, but who knows, <laughs> I don't think it'd be that in the in the two no. games before the international break, and I was completely wrong. You know, As we said, a win for City is absolutely vital. We mm-hmm. touched on it, the eight points behind Arsenal. Still have a game in hand, and will eventually have two games in hand, won't they, because of the Brighton game getting moved, if I'm not mistaken. So... I mean, it depends where they all fall, don't they? The fixtures. It's not going the, to be the problem with the Brighton game is that if City get through to the Champions League yeah. semi-finals, the only slot that the Brighton game will be able to be played is the final week of the season. Exactly. So the sort of penultimate game. So and if, mm-hmm. if that happened, if City get past Bayern Munich, City will have a, a game in hand on Arsenal until the end of the season, three days before the final day. So it's 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 going to be fascinating if mm-hmm. that happens. It's a completely different dynamic. Yeah, it's so weird because they're not going to be on even keel at once, probably no. until the end of the season. So it's going to be quite hard one to judge and Arsenal are going to be looking over the shoulder throughout. But as we say, if the gap goes to 11 points, it, no matter how many games in hand, Arsenal are going to feel very comfortable. Or not comfortable, they're going to feel very confident, sorry, going into the last 10 games. And as we touched on, they've got no distractions and are in great form and don't really look. They had that brief wobble that loss to Everton, that draw with Brentford. But other than that, they've kind of bounced back from it really strong, playing great football. All their players are in great form. I think if they get any injuries, they might be in trouble, but they've survived so far when the likes of Jesus have got hurt. You know, players get injured and then Reese Nelson pops up with a last minute win. They're like, they, they've got, it feels like they've got the winds of momentum and uh, narrative in their sails and it's going to take City some stopping. I, I think... If you ask any Arsenal fan, getting knocked out of the Europa League is one of the best things that could happen to them because they can only now focus on on that title race. And if they're playing once a week, they don't have too much two games to to fit into the schedule either. They can just take it literally one game at a time and only focus on the Premier League. That's going to be a massive boost. Now, I think it's four games until City get to play their current game in hand, and then by that time. Actually, yeah, you're right because Arsenal will have played again when City are in the uh, the FA Cup semi final, so they're not going to have a chance to to go top for for quite a while unless Arsenal drop points. And you're looking at that game on on the 26th of April. City have to win that, and especially with these sort of fixture sort of quirks that we're talking about, you you can't afford to let Arsenal go. What it, what would it be? Seven, eight, eight, ten points clear. That would just be such a psychological boost to Arsenal. Um, I was looking at the the fixture list now. The um, the FA Cup semi finals being confirmed. There's a week later this month, Wednesday the 19th, City at Bayern Munich, second leg of the uh, quarter final. That'll determine if they're successful or not in the Champions League. Obviously, everyone places such importance on that. Um, 
three days later the Wembley for the cup semi final. Do you rest players even though it's Sheffield United, but it is a, a semi final, so do you go strong and try and get there? Guardiola's spoken about uh, not turning up for these semi finals and City's poor record, so they'll want to change that and yes, they're playing championship opposition, but a very good championship opposition. And then four days after that, Arsenal rock up to the Etihad, so it's it's a make or break week, isn't it? That but mm. City have to ensure that they get to that week, still competing yeah. and still still able to to make that week count. But I think that until the, the the following week after that, where they'll have more more important fixtures and the potential semi finals in Champions League, that is going to be a defining week in the season. Yeah, well, it's, it's a defining month because I think we touched on the last mm-hmm. episode of Si. There's eight fixtures at least in April. And they're big ones. You got Liverpool at the weekend, then an away trip to Southampton, which you know bottom team. You'd usually say easy win, but of course Southampton beat City um, in the Carabao Cup. You know things have changed uh, on the South Coast already since then, so it's a different complexion altogether. But it's by no means a need, uh, you know a given. After that long trip, you got the first leg with Bayern. Then uh, Leicester City come to the Etihad. By no means easy either. Um, the away trip to Bayern, then you say the semi-final, the uh, Arsenal match, and then Fulham, who've been, um, you know, they end the month with an away trip to Fulham. And we know how much Pep Guardiola hates going to London. <laughs> and Fulham themselves gave City a right torrid time um, earlier in the season. Only a last-minute penalty got them that game won. Um, would would have beaten United in that semi-final, um, that quarter-final, if they didn't absolutely implode in the most spectacular fashion. So that's... You know, and then that's not even talking about May, where there could be Champions League semi-finals um, in between the league fixtures, which aren't easy either. The three teams who are competing at the bottom of the table to stay in the league, and Chelsea, and then an away trip to Brentford and an away trip to Brighton. In there, it's it's you know April itself is what we're soon going to be in, and it's crucial. But this next two months for City is going to be absolutely haggering work. I think Guardiola said it. Everyone was saying, you know, you're you 10 unbeaten, you've won six or seven in a row, three clean sheets and or a lot of clean sheets in a row and, and you're doing really well. And he said, yeah, it's good, but it means nothing if we don't back it up in April. And he then said, if we do a good April, then it'll mean nothing if we don't back it up in May. And I mean, you don't win any prizes for having a good a good March or a good April. You've got to back it up when with the games that, that do matter and City are, are doing well. I think it'll be an interesting game against Liverpool just to see are they going to carry on that momentum or has the international break sort of slowed them down a bit? It's probably a good fixture, as I said before, to to get back and, and motivate themselves to do that. And I mean, yeah, they're, they're travelling up and down the country around Europe, games every few days and they won't have a week off until the end of the season now, unless they get knocked out of the Champions League. City have been here before and they, they know what to do, but going and doing it is a, is another thing altogether. Well, it's certainly going to be an exciting run into the season. We're glad um, club football is back. And, of course, we'll be covering it in all its uh, glorious details over on manchesterunionnews.co.uk forward slash Manchester City. And, dear listeners, that is the end of the Talking City podcast. Thank you very much for listening. If you want to watch it in living colour, of course, you can go over to our brand new YouTube channel, Manchester Evening News dash Man City. You can get us on Twitter at Man City MEN and our Facebook page is Manchester Evening News dash Manchester City. Go over there to keep all up to date for the latest expert analysis, opinions and, of course, uh, breaking news and you know, we'll all be following the Saturday's game very, very closely. It's set to be a thriller and hopefully the Blues come out with all three points. We'll be back early next week to discuss if they have or haven't. Certainly going to be interesting either way, you should imagine. But until then, everyone, thank you once again for listening and ta-ra.